Hello. So I have a question to start with. How many of you have been out here in Canterbury at night and looked up at the stars? Yeah, hands up, hands up. It's spectacular. If you haven't done this, this is one of the best places on Earth to do that. So I recommend that you go out and do that. Take your kids out and show them the night sky. Now, the reason I say this is because when I was a small child, that's exactly what happened to me. My grandmother used to take me outside and show me the night sky, and uh, we used to try and count the stars. And that love of the night sky from when I was a very small child led me into the career that I have today um, in astrophysics and other areas now. But unlike when I was a small child, it's not the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum that I use for my research. I'm actually a radio astronomer, and I use arrays of radio telescopes like these to literally image the universe in a different light. Now, some people think that radio telescopes are not capable of making beautiful images of the heavens. I think those people are wrong. What you're seeing here is an image of our galaxy, the Milky Way, made in three radio colors with a telescope called the Murchison Widefield Array, which, as Nat says, I am the chair of the board for. Um, this image was made in New Zealand by members of my research team. And you can see in it the beauty of radio astronomy and the beauty of our galaxy. So you see blue glowing clouds of hydrogen gas. You see circular yellow objects, which are supernova remnants, which is the most spectacular way that a star can die. And there's a huge amount of science that we can get from an image like this. But I'm not here to talk to you today about that science. What I'm here to talk to you today is about the way we extract information from astronomy projects and images like this and how that has to change. So astronomers are driven to understand the universe. And that means we want to make higher and higher resolution images, which drives us to build bigger and bigger telescopes. And that gives us a big data problem. In my lifetime alone, I've been involved in the design and construction of three major radio telescopes the Low Frequency Array in the Netherlands, the Murchison Widefield Array, which we use to make this picture, which is in Australia, and the Square Kilometre Array, which, as Nat mentioned, um, is a vast project which will be constructed in Australia and South Africa. Now, many people in New Zealand know about the SKA because New Zealand is a partner country in the SKA and was originally bidding with Australia to host some of the infrastructure here in the South Island. Unfortunately, our bid to host the infrastructure didn't make it through the rigorous site selection process, but that really doesn't matter. What matters is that New Zealand is involved and a partner country in one of the world's largest scientific projects. The SKA involves 10 countries, 500 scientists and engineers, and will construct 200 dishes, not unlike the ones you can see behind me in South Africa, and over 130,000 dipoles in Australia. It is a vast instrument. And with such an instrument, you can do a huge array of science. And in fact, we wrote a book last year on all the science you could do with the SKA, and it was 2,000 pages long. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about that science, as I said, but what I will do is I'll like to sum up all of that in one sentence for you. So the SKA is a device which will allow us to make the highest resolution, fastest frame rate movie of the evolving radio universe ever. Now, those of you that have ever dealt with video know that if you make movies, video, it uses a huge amount of data. And the SKA is no different. So these two graphics behind me here give you some of the stats for the two instruments that we're going to build that make up the SKA in South Africa and Australia. And what I want you to notice here is that when we switch this instrument on, in a few years' time, we will be collecting 160 terabytes of data per second. That is the equivalent of 35,000 DVDs per second. Now, the computing that we need to be able to process those data does not yet exist. We started designing this project 20 years ago with the view that the exponential growth in technology of computing would allow us to do this in 2020. So think about that. The exponential growth of computing was built into the design of this telescope. If we don't have that growth continue, then we're going to have a problem. Fortunately, 
we've been lucky so far. So that's great. That's the raw data rate, 160 terabytes per second. But we are going to mix that down to basically images or frames of our radio movie. Now, when we do that, we get it down to about one petabyte per day. So instead of 35,000 DVDs worth of data per second, we get 200,000 DVDs worth of data per day. OK, that's cool. That's lots of data. But as you've heard, having data is not enough. You have to turn those data into knowledge. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to work out ways to sift through this huge mountain of data. Now, traditionally in astronomy, the way that this has been done is through a technique called eyeballing. That is literally looking at images and writing down anything interesting that you see. So here you see a group of women at Harvard University in around 1900, and they are doing just that. They are looking at optical images from a telescope. You can see them holding magnifying glasses, and they're writing down interesting things in a ledger. These women are called women computers. These are the first computers that we had in astronomy. And the first job that I had in astronomy 20 years ago was pretty much exactly the same. So my job was to look at optical images from a telescope with a handheld magnifying glass, write down interesting things that I saw. So computing has come a long way since 1900. And you would hope that this is not the way that we still do uh, science in astrophysics. Well, yes and no. As it turns out, while we do have very good computer algorithms to help us automatically find things in images, we don't yet have something that can fully replace the human eye-brain connection. But that's coming. So I'd like to talk to you about an example that we've had recently. So this is an image of three quarters of the sky. This was made by the Murchison Widefield Array Telescope in Australia. And um, my team and a bunch of other international radio astronomers have been working on this project for three years. We released this two weeks ago. So here you see the universe as it would look like if you had radio eyes. And this is, again, in three radio colors. So you see the vast strip in the center. That's the Milky Way galaxy, our home, awash with radio emission. And you see lots and lots and lots of little dots on that image. Those are not stars. Every single one of those dots is a radio galaxy with a supermassive black hole at its core. Every single dot represents a black hole with more than a million times the mass of our sun. Now, it would be impossible to count all of those by hand, and we didn't. We, we used a computer to do that, and there are, in fact, over 300,000 of these things here. And the way that we do that is through an algorithm, which is called a thresholding algorithm, which at its core is very, very simple. So the way that thresholding algorithms work is they look for groups of pixels which are next to each other and above some brightness level or threshold. Let me show you how that works. We're going to zoom in. We're going to zoom into this part here. And then we're going to zoom in again to this part here. And instead of in three radio colors, I'm going to just put it into one. So there you are there, one radio frequency. Thresholding algorithms look at the brightness of pixels and their proximity, as I've said. So if we take a one-dimensional cut through this image there, and I look at the brightness distribution, it looks like this. And I can say to a computer, please tell me all the pixels that sit above that red line. And it will happily go away and do that. And we do that in two dimensions. And that's how a thresholding algorithm works. And it goes away and it finds all the sources. But in the image behind me, in the colored image, you can see it's not just groups of bright pixels. There's this kind of fuzzy, faint, diffuse stuff. So this is something you can easily see with your eye, but how, how does an algorithm go? Well, in order to tell you about that, first I have to tell you about the anatomy of a radio galaxy. So remember, every one of those dots there is a radio galaxy, and if I could zoom in on every one of those with enough resolution, it would look like this. So here you see an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is an optical telescope in the background, overlaid with an image from a radio telescope, the very large array in the US, in that kind of pinky purple stuff. And you see these huge, big jets. That's what every one of those dots would look like if I could image it at this resolution. Now, to give you a sense of scale, these things are millions of light years across. So if I wanted to travel from one end of that object to the other, traveling at the speed of light, so traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second, it would still take me over a million years. OK, so 
the anatomy of a radio galaxy. You have a core in the center, optical galaxy. It's got supermassive black hole. And then you've got these two jets, which are the results of uh, electrons being flung out very close to the speed of light and embedded in a magnetic field. And they give rise to radio emission that we can detect with our telescopes. OK, now, this is very bright. It's easy to see. A thresholding algorithm can find it. But what about something which is dim? Well, here's an example of what a dim radio galaxy looks like. So hopefully up the back, you can just see at the limits of your human visual perception that there are two fuzzy blobs in that image. Can you see it? Yeah, OK. So how does the thresholding algorithm go? Well, it finds those blue boxes. It totally misses those faint, fuzzy things, which means that if we're using this type of algorithm to automatically classify what we see in our survey of three quarters of the sky, we're missing a huge amount of information. And in fact, in my opinion, some of the most interesting information. So we're missing the lobes of these faint radio galaxies. We're missing old dead supernova remnants. We're missing shock waves on cosmic scales, which is actually what I study. So how do we deal with this now, right now, today? We're still eyeballing. These are my research assistants, and they've just spent three months going over that image that I showed you of three quarters of the sky to find all of those defaint, faint a few sources that the cataloging algorithms have missed. Now, you might say, OK, four people, three months, one FTE. That's not a big deal. This is a job that humans should continue to do. However, when we redo this survey with the square kilometer array, we will have 350,000 times more data. And I don't think anyone is going to give me 350,000 research assistants. So we have to find a better way to do this. We have to do this with machines. And so we've been working uh, for the last four years um, on trying to find an algorithm that will do better than this. So I've been working with my colleagues Marcus Fran, Chris Hollett, and Tony Butler-Yeoman in the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Victoria University to work on a new algorithm which we call Oddity. So let's see how it does. So this is our image again. Hopefully you can see those fuzzy things. This is the thresholding algorithm, which totally misses them. And then this is what Oddity does. Ooh, come on. There we go. OK, so it detects those faint lobes, those things that you can just barely see with your human visual perception system, which is enormously complicated. This might look simple, but it's actually really hard for a machine to do. And the way that Oddity does this is exactly the same way as your brain does it. It's not looking just at individual pixels around something. It's looking at the whole image. It's not making assumptions about it. It's just looking at it as you do and then working uh, where things are that are different statistically. Now, that's cool. That's one part of the pattern recognition plan. So part one is to be able to see these fuzzy things to start with with a machine. Part two is to be able to know that a radio galaxy has two of those things and a core in the center. And that's where we need AI. So in the next phase of this project, we can combine this algorithm with the AI that you've just heard about to start to be able to do some really interesting things. So not only can I say, hopefully, in the future to my robot telescope, you know, where are all the radio galaxies? I can actually ask it things about those radio galaxies. How bright are they? How far away are they? You know, how big are they? And this type of problem is not just a problem for astronomy. Astronomy is driving us to do this because we're going through this enormous data expansion in astronomy. But there are other fields. So these are some examples where humans are being asked to look for things uh, which I think will become redundant in the future. So this is the surface of Mars. So you're seeing the polar regions of Mars, and those black fuzzy things there that you see, which we can detect with our algorithm, are uh, regions where there's been geyser-like upheavals from something which was solid under the ice core and went from a solid straight to a gas. NASA wants you to count those things. This is a cryo-electron microscope image of a protein. And you can see all those little sort of fuzzy patches in the protein. Again, people are being asked to count those by hand. You don't want to do that by hand. You want to do it with an algorithm. And this is my favorite. This is a droplet of seawater, which is full of plankton. And researchers want to know how much plankton there is in the sea. And there's a lot of sea. 
And so they take these droplets and they count by hand where the plankton are. And you can see these boxes drawn around there by a person doing that. In fact, these guys actually tried to do it with an algorithm, and their algorithm finds all the plankton, but it finds a whole bunch of other stuff too, and you don't want it to do that. Our algorithm doesn't do that. Our algorithm is as good as me. It has 96% accuracy, and it can find things that only astronomers with 20 years of training, such as me, can actually find in these images. That is enormously impressive. So my hope for the future is that this enormous amount of data that we're going to produce with instruments like the SKA and this exponential technology expansion that we're seeing with things like AI and algorithms is going to come together. So we were asked yesterday to know what industry you're really in, know what industry is going to disrupt your industry, and then what tasks uh, humans can do better than AI. So I started out in radio astronomy, but apparently I'm not really in radio astronomy. Apparently I'm in computer science and AI. It's that field that's going to disrupt my science field. And I sincerely hope that AI takes my job away. I hope that AI allows us to move from having to classify all these things by humans to getting closer to the science that we want to do. So in the future, if we can pull this off, I see a vast potential for an exponential expansion in the science that we do, not just in my field, but in all of yours and in all others. And so I hope we are moving very close to the day when I am not just counting the stars, a machine is doing it for me. Thank you.